Your Excellency, the Ambassador for Italy, Gian Ludovico De Martino di Montegiordano. Benvenuto all'Università di Melbourne. Um, Rupert Meyer and uh, Mark Considine, distinguished guests, one and all, and I recognize many familiar faces in the audience and, and many people who know a great deal about Italy, and I thank you very much for coming, because there's a lot going on in Melbourne tonight. I'd also like to thank uh, Tasman Courtney and her team in the Faculty of Arts for putting on the lecture. As Rupert told you, it opens at the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra on the 9th of December, and it's been an enormous pleasure to work with Ron Radford and his team of, of curators uh, and, and experts there. It is truly a very special exhibition. There are exhibitions and exhibitions. There are the blockbusters of Picasso. We've had four, I think, in Australia recently. We've had four or five Impressionist exhibitions the last few years. But it's the first ever occasion on which Australians will be able to see Italian works of art from the 15th and 16th centuries. They're not only Italian works of art, but they are some of the best loved works by Bellini and Botticelli that exist, that were ever created, that are able to travel. They come from an Italian collection, the Accademia Carrara in Bergamo, and that was a gallery that was formed before national galleries were even imagined, or let alone created. That is, it was formed before London National Gallery existed, before the Louvre, uh, before Berlin, or even Melbourne, or even Canberra for that matter. <laughs> Given this very early provenance for the paintings, they are uh, particularly special. Scholars frequently debate, oh dear, <laughs> the meaning of the word Renaissance. Some wish to dispense with the term altogether in favor of an anodyne expression like the modern period. But that magical, intellectually chic Italian word, rinascita, literally meaning rebirth or revival, was used by artists in the 16th century in Italy to describe the renewal of art that they perceived to be taking place in their own time. And it therefore seems right to have this as the title of an exhibition about that period. Foremost among those who used the word was the first art historian ever, Giorgio Vasari, in a book that has been continuously in print since 1550. No mean achievement. His Lives of the Artists, Painters and Sculptors. And in that book, he uses the word rinascita some six times, always in the context of the progress of art in his own age, which he saw as the three ages of man, infancy, birth, and maturity. In this exhibition, we have just youth and maturity, no infancy. This is uh, a representation by Botticelli of the story of Virginia. It's one of the great works by, of Botticelli's late period of the last decade of his life, and it shows how complex the rebirth of antiquity could be in the creation of a new style. The panel depicts a classical story from Livy's History of Rome, in which, in which episodes of judicial atrocity and murder are imagined against a background of classical architecture. It's a style that imaginatively revives the language and subject matter of Roman art and literature. It's a complex picture to read with some 50 figures in it. On the left-hand side, Virginia, a schoolgirl, receives the unwanted attentions of Appius, who tries unsuccessfully to abduct her. Her maidservants yell and save her, but nevertheless, in the absence of her father, she's taken before the judge, Marcus Claudius, who lusts after her. Uh, he uh, declares her a slave, and she is taken away, upon which her father returns, kills her, and in order to maintain her honor, uh, declares her dead. <laughs> Indignation at Virginia's death provokes a revolt against a tyrannical government. As Boccaccio succinctly explains, in, to a Florentine audience in the first book dedicated to famous women. The significance of Virginia's life was that she was famous not so much for her constancy as for the wickedness of her ill-starred potential lover. The extraordinary severity of her father and the liberty of the Romans that resulted from it. This is not a simple example from the classics. Moreover, this work, we think, was made for a frieze in a Renaissance palace, in fact, for a bedroom of two uh, newly wed young Florentines, um, Giovanni Vespucci and his bride, Namicina di Benedetto Nelli, who married in 1500. 
We think that there were more works by Botticelli in this bedroom. Uh, one is the Lucrezia, which is in Boston, and it was clearly the companion piece to this Virginia, but the whole palace may well have had uh, a whole frieze uh, along the top wall. What a complex message to a young bride and groom lie. <laughs> um, in preparation for the lecture, I did a little work in Florence, and there's never been any literature on the exact location of the paintings. Uh, but it's probably the Palazzo, Palazzo Vespucci in the Via dei Servi. And you can just see um, on the edge of this uh, the Brunelleschi's cupola of the Domo in the distance. So you can see it's very, very close. So perhaps it's argued by some art historians this young couple uh, lying in bed was given an anti medicine message by this <laughs> story of, of Virginia, at least one of uh, honour and how to behave as, as young people. Um, it's now the seat of a a bank, it's hard to get inside, but the architecture is quite gorgeous, and that you can see from the view of the, of the lower first floor down there. Um, as I said, the exhibition comes from the Accademia Carrara in Bergamo, and this is a museum that claims to be the first public museum in the world, the first museum that's open to the public. Italian museums are often created from previously existing aristocratic or ecclesiastical collections. Uffizi, for example, is basically the Medici collections. The Vatican represents the papal collections. But in the case of Bergamo, it's a collection of collections by three distinguished philanthropists, Count Giacomo Carrara, Count Guglielmo Locus, and Giovanni Morelli, who each had particular political conceptions of what the Renaissance meant to Italy and who each attempted to stamp their authority on earlier collections in order to prove their, their, their point. My lecture this evening follows a tripart organisation, each bit based on one of these collectors, beginning with uh, the founder of the institution, Count Giacomo Carrara. It's important to remember that in this period in Italy, that is when these collections were formed from about 1740 to 1891, or from 1740 to 1861, Italy was under foreign occupation for most of that period. So during Carrara's lifetime, basically most of Italy was controlled by Spain or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And for the most of the life of Locus it was too, and also until the age of 60 for Giovanni Morelli. So collecting for them was a political act. It was a reaffirmation of Renaissance culture and to place high value on the cultural heritage of a period in Italy uh, which was great in Italian history and lent force to their period, which was known as the Risorgimento. And the Risorgimento doesn't, it's one of those delicious Italian words that doesn't really translate very well into English. We call it the resurgence. But this is the values, if you like, of the Renaissance for this period in the Risorgimento. Now, the founder of this institution, in this absolutely gorgeous Baroque portrait by Fra Galgario, was a man who, I suppose in Melbourne, we might imagine to be a bit like Redmond Barry. He had a vision of the institutions that he wanted to create for his city. And Fra Galgario portrays Carrara as a young man. Um, it's, a, it's a late Baroque portrait from a period of art history that we call magical impressionism. What a divine term. And it's, uh, it shows this young man dreaming of what he's going to do, and he sort of begins to achieve things, in fact, after the death of his father. He created a collection, uh, some of which you'll see in Canberra, and uh, this formed the basis of the Academia Carrara Pinacoteca. He also, and this was very important, created an artist academy, which is still flourishing today, and he commissioned art historical books, historiographies, in uh, contradiction of what Vasari had done uh, from a friend of his called uh, Francesco Maria Tassi. And uh, in this book that Tassi painted, he created the first biographies of artists like Lorenzo Lotto. Uh, four of whose works are in this exhibition. We're looking at two of them uh, now. <laughs> and there, as we'll see, a, another altarpiece in the, in the course of the lecture. And Lorenzo Lotto is a figure a little bit like Caravaggio. He's been rediscovered in the 1980s. He's odd, he's capricious, he's not, however, violent. Um, <laughs> and you can see, and he's identified with Bergamo. He's been a little bit left out 
of history until the, 15, until the 1980s. Um, and he sort of emerged in those exhibitions of Venetian painting at the Royal Academy and elsewhere. He lived in Bergamo from 1513 to 1525, and he painted portraits of local nobility, such as Lucina Brembati, who we see here on the left, and this drop-down bed gorgeous young patrician man, whose name we don't know, on the right. And, <laughs> um, and the National Gallery have used this image as the, um, as on the cover of the invitation to the exhibition. Um, and I think it's a very uh, seductive and wonderful one. Now, in the interpretation of um, these portraits, Lotto is a very edgy painter. And uh, he has, she's rather overdressed. He's got the most wonderful jewellery on. Lotto always put this jewellery on that makes you want to kill for it, almost. And there's sort of wonderful pearls. But she has right down her middle a huge uh, uh, instrument that people interpret as a toothpick, or also as an allegory of fortune. And so is this a toothpick that such an elegant lady would ever have used? Or is it on her as a, an a sort of, is she wanting to become pregnant? Or what exactly is happening? Uh, there is a little rebus of her name. The, her name means um, moon and light. And there's this little moon with, with light on it in the upper left-hand corner, which refers to her first name, uh, Lucina. Um, from Tassie's biography, which is the first thing that Carrara commissioned, there were a great number of books written on um, Lotto, probably the best of which is Bernard Berenson's uh, really great book, A Monograph and Biography of Lorenzo Lotto. Um, and so he's someone who will emerge in the Canberra exhibition as being very special. He's someone you can only see in northern Italy, and he's someone whom Vasari uh, dismisses among the pupils of Giovanni Bellini. Now... Um, I said that there were three collectors. Um, this is uh, Carrara, whom you're already getting to know. And then there's Locus, uh, Guglielmo Locus. Now, he is someone who, who, who has a taste for portraiture, for early paintings. He's also pro-Austrian. He's mayor or syndico of, of Bergamo from 1842 to 1848. And he's, um, he's pro-Austrian during all of that period. Um, this is a, a really fabulous portrait of him. All these portraits are in the exhibition because the exhibition is conceptualised as being about the taste of these three men. And this is a portrait by a local artist called Giovanni Carnavale, who's known affectionately in Italian as Il Piccio, meaning tiny. And it's a portrait made in 1835, a date when uh, Lurkus decided to get rid of all of Carrara's Baroque paintings because he didn't like the Baroque. <laughs> and that one thinks is a very great pity because, um, you know, obviously he knew what the Baroque was about. You can tell this from, um, from the portrait that he commissioned. And the other person in all of this is Giovanni Morelli. And Giovanni Morelli is shown here both in a portrait by Lanebach and a contemporary unpublished photograph uh, of him. Um, the portrait shows this man who invented connoisseurship who was the first elected member to the <coughs> first uh, parliament of Italy in 1861. He was a Protestant, um, so this is all very unusual in an Italian context. And on the right, you can see him looking very informal in a bohemian flat in Milan, uh, where he lived. Uh, he is a person who uh, was responsible for the creation of many uh, great collections, and the Botticelli that we saw at the beginning of the lecture was something uh, that he, he, he collected. So these are the three personalities that I'll be looking at and uh, what the Renaissance meant to them and what they bought. Carrara loved, he had a passion for 15th century art and particularly for Lombard altarpieces, which are rare anywhere. This is a painting by Bartolomeo Viverini known as the Scanzo Politique. It's huge, it's wonderful. I don't think there's anything, ever been anything like this in Australia before. And uh, he bought it and exchanged it uh, with an 18th century altarpiece uh, for a church at Scanzo. This is a, a detail from it. It's an extraordinary drawing, uh, extraordinary, extraordinarily beautiful. Many of the paintings in the exhibition are for private devotion. And this is a painting uh, by uh, Vincenzo Foppa, uh, about which Felicity Harley McGowan has written for the catalogue. It is, has a strange uh, signature on it, uh, which, we, which is definitely Foppers, and also a hard-to-decipher date, which may be Easter Monday, April 
1456. When Carrara bought the painting, he was very jubilant. He'd found a signature by this man. You mightn't have heard of Foppa, but for, if you're in Lombardy, he's like Raphael. Um, and uh, it's a very intense, personal, um, sort of wonderful thing, and it's probably his earliest work. And Carrara wrote to a friend of his called Borzetti about how the three figures of Christ and the two thieves created a sort of architecture of the body within the painted panel, and how the perspective was very carefully realized in a Florentine manner. And many of, when you go to the exhibition, as I hope you will, many of the preparatory <laughs> lines for the perspective are seen along the cornices of the bottom. It's a highly mystical um, and superb painting. This is uh, another painting in the exhibition. I'm on the whole only showing paintings that are in the exhibition. I'm not giving you a comparative um, um, <laughs> lecture. Uh, but this, I mean, they are, as you've seen already, of extraordinary quality. And this is uh, Lotto's masterpiece of 1523, uh, an outstanding work of the mystical marriage of St. Catherine. It was probably painted according to Lotto's correspondence uh, for his patrician landlord in Bergamo in lure of the rent that Lotto owed him. <laughs> um, he, he got along very well with his landlord. Uh, who was called Niccolo Bongi, and Niccolo Bongi is portrayed as a portrait on the left-hand side in a place where usually uh, St. Joseph is. It's a very unusual iconography, and at some point uh, the canvas was, um, the top part, a landscape, was cut out by French soldiers. So that sort of rather neutral grey area should perhaps be a, a, a landscape of Bergamo or Calvary or some um, appropriate uh, sort of subject. It's very, um, it's very moving devotionally. It's a very unusual portrait of Bongi. And um, Lotto signs his name on the footstool of the Virgin. Lotto loves putting his signature in very interesting devotional parts of a painting. And Bongi himself blesses with one hand and holds his other hand to the heart. Um, it's an extraordinary painting and often chosen as the covers for um, monographs and that sort of thing. I want just a little bit to look at um, Bergamo itself, for those of you who haven't been there. This is the first known image of Bergamo. It's in an illuminated manuscript of Pope Gregory I's Life of St. Benedict, uh, in a manuscript in Mantua, dated from 1450. The drawing represents St. Benedict reading his rule to his followers in the meadow of St. Alexander, before the upper city, known as the Citta Alta. And the Citta Alta is inscribed um, Bergamum, rather lovely, lovingly. And in fact, all the major monuments in the upper city have their names on them in Lombard dialect. So the supposition is that perhaps the artist was someone like Bonifazio Bembo or a local Lombard artist. It's very high quality. And Bergamo today, um, this is actually a 19th century print of Bergamo from the meadow of St. Alexander looking up at the upper city, but the city today has, is very much as it was in the Renaissance period. It has a long durée, you might say. The next representation of Bergamo is from uh, 1693. Um, and it shows you the, the form of urban Bergamo, uh, which was created by uh, the Venetian general, Sforza Pallavicino. From 1428 to 1797, Bergamo was administered by the Republic of Venice, it was far enough away from both, both cities to resist cultural domination. And the iconography of their paintings is often a sort of jokey parody or interplay with what's going on in those other cities. The form, this shows you how deep the walls are. They're extraordinarily deep um, and uh, extraordinarily wonderful to run or walk along the, the walls of the, of the city. Um, the entrance to the upper city is often, the best entrance is really at a place called Sant'Agostino. We're looking at the gate of Sant'Agostino, which is 16th century Venetian gate, and then the medieval monastery, uh, from which we have an altarpiece, which I'm not actually showing you, uh, but it's an important altarpiece that was commissioned by a famous humanist. Um, so this is an aerial view of it. This is an aerial view of the Citta Alta, and the important uh, central part is the Piazza Vecchia is here with the Bibliotheca Angelo Mai, the University of uh, Bergamo, the Faculty of Languages, uh, the Palazzo della Ragione, 
and, and here are sort of shops and restaurants and that sort of thing. And then through here, the Piazza del Duomo. These are the monuments you can't take to Melbourne or to Canberra. <laughs> but um, they're, they're sort of wonderful to, to visit. And probably the most famous, the most extraordinary of all of them is the Cappella Colleoni uh, by Giovanni Antonio Amadeo from the 1470s. And Colleoni was the great uh, condottiere of Bergamo, who uh, was a very powerful person indeed. But to return to the paintings, that shows you the beauty of the city and uh, the sort of culture that, that they were uh, sort of preferring. I'm going to move on now to look at Locus's uh, collection um, and uh, Giovanni Morelli, uh, who was at that stage, when Locus died, he, he left intact a self-built um, Pinacoteca uh, based on the model of the Pantheon, quite an extraordinary building which still exists outside of Bergamo. But the city decided that they didn't want a museum out in the country, they wanted to bring it in. And they thought they were rather short of money, so they decided to sell a third of the collection. So in all of these cases, all of these collect collectors, uh, there often happens a certain amount of deaccessioning, tidying up of the past goes on. But in this particular case, and I think you'll see, Morelli really went for the best paintings for his native city. So um, it's quite interesting. The, there is something that's unpublished that I quite find quite fascinating, and that's an annotated uh, copy of um, the first, first catalogue of the Locus collection in which uh, you have Morelli's uh, annotations. And he looked at this painting by Cosme Tura, a Ferrarese artist, and Morelli's well known for looking at anatomical details of things. And as usually, he looked at hands and feet and eyes. But he, he here, here describes uh, long cartilaginous ears and eyelids like nautilus shells. And it's a sort of wonderful description of, of this Tura uh, bejeweled uh, way of doing things. This is a fragment from a polyptych, and there's a lot of interpretation as to which polyptych it comes from. Uh, we don't really know. But it's a, it's a wonderful, um, gorgeously um, bejeweled, intellectually sensual image of the Madonna and child from court culture in Italy. Arguably, the most wonderful painting in the exhibition, also from the Locus collection, is Raphael's Saint Sebastian. And that's been shown on many of the um, illustrations for the exhibition. This is a painting that from the first time that Raphael was written about in modern art historical literature from the 19th century has always been thought to be a great painting. It has a double nimbus um, and it's always been thought of and discussed in terms of Raphael's stylistic development between 1501 to 1504. The composition is extraordinarily unusual. The condition's excellent. And when you see it in Canberra, you'll be able to see that the, you can decipher such details. You can sort of almost see Raphael painting the hair over the landscape on the edges of the face. It's, despite the unusual format, it's never been cut. It's not a detail. It's not a fragment of anything. The work must have been very famous early on because it's copied by Raphael's students. Uh, there are several painted copies and a print after it's an early print. Um, so we don't know the first location or where it was uh, done for. But what always strikes me about the painting when I first look at it is Saint Sebastian is dressed in exquisite luxury, that sort of male luxury that women sort of absolutely find amazing, the exquisite um, fine cotton undershirt edged in black embroidered with geometric and wavy lines in golden thread, and the pattern emphasised with delicate black kiss crosses highlighted against the gold and white and his green velvet vest is further adorned with detailed golden embroidery. Now, the iconography of the saint is somewhat unusual. Now, this is um, a document that I found that shows Loka, where Locus bought it with a, uh, a local dealer in the 1830s, and he paid hardly any money for it at all. So he, I think you have to admire Locus for being a great collector. But the normal iconography of Saint Sebastian is Saint Sebastian nude, uh, suffering arrows being uh, put into him. I'll show you another example. I'm showing you this example by Boltrafio, by Leonardo's most favourite pupil. And I, I do love the, 
sort of um, nonchalance of Saint Sebastian in this picture. <laughs> he's, sort of, he's sort of, I think, <laughs> Voltrafio is a sort of very interesting character. He's um, a very nobleman and very wealthy, and he didn't have to learn to paint, but he became one of Leonardo's famous pupils. And we do have in the exhibition the Madonna, and it's the cheekiest Madonna ever. Um, the, the nipple is actually right in the bullseye center of the painting. And he's, he's, a, he's a very sort of um, very amusing sort of artist. But anyway, the point is that uh, Saint Sebastian looks very different in the Raphael. I think, and it's never been pointed out before, but I think it's very like Giorgione's uh, version of Saint Sebastian. It's an one of the absolutely certain versions of Saint Sebastian by Giorgione. It's in Vienna in the Kunsthistorisches Museum. And it's from about the same years. It's almost the, precisely the same time. And the Giorgione one has often thought to be a portrait of a theatrical person, a sort of general portrait. And looking back at the locust catalogues, the early locust catalogues about the collection, when you had about five pages written about this picture, um, they suggest that it's a Raphael self-portrait uh, from this period. And um, I sort of thought, oh, well, they, they, everyone's always trying to see self-portraits everywhere. But uh, if you look at the self-portraits that we have of Raphael from about this period, I think you couldn't prove it, but it's certainly, as the Italians say, suggestivo. <laughs> it's one of those things that's sort of, you know, worth um, uh, playing around with. Now, there are um, very interesting paintings like um, this extraordinary portrait. Uh, by an, it's now attributed to an artist called Alto Bello Melone, which means the tall, beautiful melon, which is a sort of wonderful Italian name. But um, in, when Locus bought the painting, he thought he was buying Giorgione's portrait of Cesare Borgia. And um, it's a very romantic portrait. Of course, you all know who Cesare Borgia is. He is the Duke of Valentino and the flamboyant, illegitimate son of the Borgia Pope, Alexander VI. Um, and the identity of the sitter, we don't really know today. But should you Google um, Cesare Borgia on the internet, you will come up with all sorts of actors trying to look like this portrait. Um, <laughs> so the whole sort of, this is sort of has never been sort of um, gotten rid of, as it were. Um, what, what's fabulous about the picture, and I remember when I was showing Ron Radford the catalogue things, he sort of looked at it and he couldn't believe how beautiful the background is. There is this dramatic disturbed background with a blue expressionistic storm, and there's an agitated sky thought to be an allusion in the early interpretation of it to the soul of Cesare, who characterized by Machiavelli as being above morality. Um, <laughs> now, it's very hard to understand what the image is about, but it's quite exciting and surreal and engrossing. Uh, there are small figures of a man and woman who are beaten by the wind, and their faces are covered with drapery. And the base, from this base of this tree, um, there's this new uh, sh shoot sort of sprouting out. But it's the sort of, the sort of force of the man himself, the, the glove in your face, the, the strong face that has, has led to such fascination uh, uh, with it. Um, we also know that um, uh, he collected... One of the things about Bergamo is that it's an economically wealthy town. It's a town that... Um, um, has always been quite economically wealthy, and people don't sell their pictures. So these are two portraits uh, commissioned um, uh, from this extraordinary artist Moroni of the noblewoman Countess Parche Peace and Count Bernardo. They were wealthy cloth, cloth manufacturers, and these uh, pictures remain from the middle of the 16th century uh, till, the 17, till the 19th century in the family's uh, homes. Um, there's an extraordinary beauty of the blacks and the way the, the costumes are constructed. And they're, they're quite moving uh, pictures, and there's a moving personal story uh, related to them. But they stay in the same collection till, um, till, quite, till quite recently, really. And this is true of many paintings in Bergamo that stay uh, in, the same, in the same collections. But the most fabulous painting, <laughs> the most fabulous painting from Locus's collection, in my view, is the one I chose for the, um, for this, uh, for the image on the poster. And this is known as the Locus Madonna. 
It, uh, there are two Bellinis in this exhibition, and both are extraordinary. Uh, they're both truly extraordinary. Uh, there are, Bellini's an artist who you might say has about a thousand paintings, which is a lot for this sort of period, and many of them are not high quality, but these are. Um, and this has excited an extraordinary amount of speculation. It was acquired in 1843 by Locus uh, for the sum of 675 lira, a price that unbelievably also included a work by Bartolomeo Viverini. We know that Locus thought he was buying a painted cover of a window, a davanzali d'una finestra, interpreting rather literally the composition in which the Christ child struggles with his mother on the pink marble parapet of a window frame. We do have um, painted covers to windows that survive from the Renaissance. The Carpaccio and the Getty of the Heron Hunt in the Lagoon is one of those. But there's no um, evidence that's come through in conservation that this, in fact, is. It's just the composition that made him see that. The composition is, in a way, Byzantine in origin, but Bellini always modified uh, Byzantine uh, compositions and infused them with a sort of Renaissance background. He was deeply religious. He's a deeply religious artist. And the background consists of green-gray cloth with regular folds. It's just, it's been taken from a cassone, perhaps a trousseau chest. Against this, the architecture of the Madonna's blue coke of lapis lazuli is infused with myriad lines of gold and defines her pensive presence. There's never been a Madonna so indifferent or seemingly to her child. The strong underdrawing, visible in part, enhances the dynamic composition, especially in the form of the wriggling child. The Virgin dreams while her child struggles in a pose and with an expression that's predictive of his future passion. We know little of Giovanni Bellini's biography. His wife, Ginevra Bocchetta, died young, as did his only son. But this painting has been of central importance to many theories about Bellini's personality, including speculations about his illegitimate birth and his relationship to his mother and father. In her provocative essay, Motherhood According to Giovanni Bellini, Giulia Cristeva analyzes Bellini's Madonna paintings in the light of his supposed illegitimacy and argues that it is the spectre of the absent Madonna or the absent mother that haunts these images. Cristeva explores the way in which Bellini's Madonna from the 1450s to the 1460s appear coldly distant and impassive, the Virgin's gaze drawn away from the Christ child. For Cristeva, the climax of this development is the locus Madonna. She writes of the frightened baby, who alone of all his peers frees himself violently, taking his mother's hands along with him in a brutal biographical separation. Um, whether you believe this interpretation or not, it's certainly a, a powerful and interesting one. And the locus Madonna is the key example in many interpretations of, um, uh, of Bellini, including Leo Steinberg's challenging thesis about the incarnation, where he argues that Christ is unveiled by his mother to expose his humanity, and that this makes explicit the paradox of the Christian God-man. So this is a, a key painting which will no doubt be analysed and talked about in great depth. So that is, that is just some of the highlights that are coming uh, from one man's uh, vision of the Renaissance. And you can tell just from this little overview that he loved portraiture and he loved the early Renaissance. He could have been British almost, Locus. He had this real passion for early, early painting. Um, and the Raphael was the centre of the National Gallery of London's exhibition on early Raphael, whereas the Spanish and the French have always preferred late Raphael the complexities, the contradictions, and all those sorts of things. Well, um, here's another Bellini Madonna. <laughs> um, this is known as the Alzano Madonna. And among Giovanni Bellini's many Madonna paintings, uh, this has always been recognized as a work of extraordinary quality. Bellini himself proudly signed the painting on the crumpled bit of paper on the parapet. But if you look at its exhibition history, there was a very great exhibition in 1949 after the war 
It was meant to be an affirmation of Italian nationality, and it was held in the Palazzo Ducale in Venice. And this was one of the central paintings of it. It was, it was thought to be truly extraordinary. And again, uh, very recently, the Quirinale exhibition, there have only been two major Bellini exhibitions, but this too was uh, really quite outstanding. Tenderly holding the Christ child on her knee, the Madonna is seated in front of a curtain. And the background with two cities and figures in the landscape is executed in some minute detail. Gondoliers are boating near the more distant city on the left, and a hunting party is led by a knight on horseback. And the two men rest beside a tree, identified as, a, as pilgrims by their scallop shell emblems. Um, through an extended corner of the Madonna's filmy blue mantle, Bellini allows a glimpse of the landscape in the right foreground before the walls of the castellated city where two cloaked men are engaged in conversation. The pair placed on the parapet is an allusion to the Virgin and her role as the new Eve, who together with Christ is the fruit of her womb and redeems humanity. This invention never ever again appears, this um, composition, in Bellini's uh, work and no copies uh, were made of it. Um, Bellini, I, I mentioned he, there are many hundreds of Madonna paintings by Bellini, and some of them repeat the same uh, composition. So after an infinite amount of research, art historians have worked out that probably he, you went to his workshop and you ordered a Bellini um, Madonna and you wanted it to be like this one or the other one. But this seems to be a unique composition. So why? I mean, why is this a unique and amazing thing? Well, uh, most of his uh, Madonnas, like the one, the Locust Madonna, have no early provenance, as we don't know who these pictures were made for. But in this particular case, we do, have, uh, we do know something about uh, the provenance. And it emerges in the dowry of a quite remarkable Carmelite abbess, Lucrezia, Lucrezia Aliadi Vertova, shown here in a portrait by Moroni, whom you saw earlier on, this is not a portrait in the exhibition, it's in the Metropolitan. And some of the paintings in Canberra will go to the Metropolitan afterwards, about 12 or 14, for uh, intense comparisons between uh, works that are uh, in the Metropolitan uh, collections. I think the Bellini is one of them, and the Fopper, a very important Fopper, will certainly be another. Anyway, um, this rather lucky woman um, was, was married and then widowed, and she then became an abbess for this new monastery uh, outside of Bergamo. And in her dowry uh, was the Bellini painting. Now, we don't know, but her father, Alessio Agliardi, was one of the great architects of Bergamo. And so the hypothesis that I and other scholars share is that Alessio Agliardi, who visited Venice, went to Bellini's <coughs> workshop, we know that he knew him, and probably ordered this special picture. And then when his, his daughter became an abbess, uh, he gave it to her for his dowry. So this is, a, for, this is a kind of very interesting, one of the few early Bellini Madonnas that we can take back uh, in that sort of way and give a, a sort of whole uh, context to. Now Morelli collected pictures uh, for his cousin for Bergamo, and he was an occasional collector. He didn't uh, do a lot of dealing. But he also loved paintings from the Quattrocento that could prove his attribution method. And he thought his attribution method worked best with bony pictures. Pictures that should have shown the bony, like the Tura that you saw earlier, or this particular Botticelli, the Redeemer. And uh, this is a, a very uh, profoundly uh, emotional painting, probably made in response to Savonarola's sermons in about 1500 in Florence. Um, but um, here's Morelli uh, buying this uh, for his collection because it's a, an important Botticelli and also proves his method. Now, I'm, um, there will be master classes at the National Gallery in Canberra, and I'm going to give one on the two Bellinis um, on February uh, the 22nd. Um, and these are something that the National Gallery has introduced, a lecture followed by a private visit for those who are at the lecture to look in depth, to wallow, as it were, in the interpretation and understanding of the paintings. And there are a group of those, um, and I think I'm giving the first one. They will be advertised on the website of the NGA. Uh, they're not up yet, but they will be soon. Now, also in the exhibition, a few things like playing cards, uh, these uh, Taroki, and I'm showing you a very beautiful fresco from a palace in Milan 
uh, showing how these um, cards were used in terms of aristocratic leisure. Um, they are quite beautiful and uh, we've got uh, six in the exhibition, two by Antonio Cicognara. This is an image of the world, when the world meant just your hometown, not the globalization things you have today. And then uh, an image of the moon uh, that, and, um, and um, other ones by Bonifacio Bembo. And Bonifacio Bembo you might have encountered earlier in this lecture as the miniaturist who drew the, um, um, the, the image of Bergamo in the map from, and the image from Mantua from the life of St. Benedict. Now, these, it's very difficult to interpret the tarot cards. There's a lot of literature on them, but um, I'm not going to go to it, into it in, in great detail, but collectors love these things. And going back to my theme of collecting, and they hid them, they wouldn't show them to other collectors, they were passionate about them. But then in um, 1967, the set between Bergamo was sold to Bergamo and to the Pierpont Morgan in New York. And um, at that time, uh, Franco Maria Rizzi, a rather posh and fabulous publisher, asked Italo Calvino if he'd write a book about them. So Italo Calvino wrote this um, wonderful book called The Castle of Cross Destinies, which is an interpretation of the configuration of these cards. And um, it's available in English translation, I think a bad English translation by William Weaver. But in this novel, these characters meet together in a forest and then they go into a castle and they become totally mute. And the only way they can communicate is through the cards. And so the, there is a narrator and the cards come out in different orders. And people today still in Italy play these games with the tarot cards and ask questions of them rather more basic questions. But it's a very beautiful book and it seems to have been triggered. And it's quite an interesting interpretation of the tarot cards about the meaning of um, Renaissance paintings and how meaning is created basically from looking at things visually, uh, not from texts and conversation. So it's um, a very interesting thing. Um, anyway, I'm getting towards the end of my lecture now. Um, we will be holding at the University of Melbourne a symposium on the Renaissance. Um, and Professor Deborah Howard will be visiting uh, the faculty from the University of Cambridge, and she will give a lecture, a free public lecture, on the night of the 9th of March. And we hope to have other distinguished speakers um, on, on the 10th, and if there's enough people, perhaps also the 11th, to see what the, what the reaction is. But I thought I might talk on Morelli's collection, and I know Carl Villas would like to talk on his preliminary investigations of the new Correggio at the National Gallery of Victoria. And finally, the catalogue. Um, <laughs> this is the cover to the catalogue, and um, I think it's uh, very beautiful, and they've chosen a sort of fabulous image. Finally, I think there's a real message from this lecture. If you collect, if you collect for yourself, if you collect for an institution, do so for passion, politics, real reasons, never to fill a gap. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.